It's kind of a long passage, but it's definitely worth reading carefully and closely. So let's just walk through that together and we'll try to unpack it. In John chapter 12, verse 20, we read these words. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew went with Philip, and they told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there shall my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. And then something interesting happens here. This is one of the three times that the Father speaks in all the public ministry of Jesus. You got the baptism, you got the transfiguration, and then you have this final word from the Father in heaven. And this is only in John. The Father says this, a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Now the crowd standing by heard it and said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, shall draw all men to myself. He said this to show by what death he was to die. Okay, so um, not, a, not a very familiar passage maybe to many of us, but very important for John's gospel. A couple of points about it. First, notice the context. It, the context here is the Feast of Passover, which, as I've mentioned on previous videos, was a pilgrimage festival that took place in the spring when hundreds of thousands of Jews would come together in the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the feast in the temple. And in this case, John says that there were also some who went up to the feast who were Greeks, right? Now, in context here, this appears to mean um, pagans, in other words, non-Jews, who believed in God, believed in the God of the Jews, and even wanted to celebrate and worship the God of the Jews alongside the Jews. So, in this case, what happens is, notice, they come to Philip, who is from Bethsaida in Galilee, and say that they want to see Jesus. And then Philip takes them to Andrew, uh, and Andrew tells Jesus about it. Now, what's interesting about that is, when it says that they were some Greeks, uh, they just so happened to go to the two of Jesus' disciples who have Greek names, right? So, Philippos is a very Greek name. It's not a Semitic name. It's not a Hebrew or an Aramaic name. And Andreas, which is the Greek for Andrew, is also a very Greek name. Uh, and if you recall, Jesus' disciples, uh, the bulk of them, were from Galilee, which was called Galilee of the Gentiles. And there was a lot of Greek-speaking influence, a lot of pagan influence, in the Galilee in which Jesus grew up. Um, sometimes you'll hear people uh, suggest that the Galilee in the north was completely Jewish. But we know now from archaeology as well as from other evidence from the first century A.D., that in fact the Hellenistic influence was very strong in the north, in, the, in Galilee. And you can even see that in the names of a couple of Jesus' disciples. Uh, so remember here, Andrew and Peter are brothers. Uh, Peter's name was Simon, which is a very Jewish name, Simeon. But Andrew's name, Andreas, is a Greek name. So you can already see, in other words, some of the Greek influence within the very family of St. Peter himself. So I don't think it's a coincidence here that the Greeks go to Andrew and Philip. Uh, in fact, I would suggest, and some scholars have suggested this as well, that evidently Andrew and Philip are, speak Greek well. And so these Greek-speaking uh, outsiders, these foreigners, people who are coming in from the outside to celebrate Passover, find the disciples of Jesus who speak their own language and then use them as kind of go-betweens uh, between them and Jesus, you know, intercessors on their behalf, uh, asking to see Jesus. Now, 
with all that in mind, what's the most significant point here is that the second Jesus hears that some Greeks are looking for him, he declares, now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, in order to feel the kind of magnitude of that declaration, you need to keep in mind that for the first 11 chapters of John's Gospel, Jesus has been saying over and over again, you know, my hour has not yet come, or the hour is coming uh, in the future tense. So think here about the wedding at Cana when Mary invites Jesus to solve the problem of the wine. What does he say? My hour has not yet come. So for the first 11 chapters, he's stressing that the hour is something in the future. But the second that the Greeks start looking for him, he says it's time. The hour of his passion, the hour of the Last Supper, the hour of the redemption of the world. And so you got to ask yourself here, why does Jesus say that the hour has come once the Greeks come looking for him? Well, I would suggest that Jesus, like other Jews in the first century AD, would have known that in the Old Testament, in the Jewish Bible, the prophets had said over and over again that one of the signs of the age of salvation, one of the signs of the future time of the Messiah, would be the conversion of the Gentiles, would be the fact that the Gentiles would start looking to worship the one God of Israel. Uh, the book of Zechariah, for example, describes the Gentiles grabbing onto the coat of a Jew and asking them, bring us to Jerusalem, or bring us to your God. Isaiah chapter 2, Micah chapter 4, will talk about the fact that not only will the word of God go forth from Zion, but the nations will come streaming to Jerusalem to begin worshiping the one true God. So um, what Jesus sees in these Greeks coming to look for him is a kind of sign that, the, that the, the age of salvation has now come because the Gentiles are actually starting to convert. And he hasn't even gone to the cross yet, right? So once they do this, he points forward to the time of his glorification. That's another technical term that you see Jesus use in the Gospel of John. Uh, in the Old Testament, the glorification of God would be a way of speaking about worshiping the Lord, to give glory to the Lord. Uh, in this case, Jesus uses the term glorify as a technical term for his passion and death. So that his passion and death is, in a real sense, going to be the ultimate act of praise and glory to God the Father. That's what he's going to be doing on the cross. And in order to illustrate that, he then gives this mysterious parable, kind of riddle, about the seed, the grain of wheat that falls into the earth. And he says, unless a grain of wheat falls in the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So what's he talking about here? Well, basically, he's drawing an analogy between the planting of a seed of wheat and his own passion and death. So Jesus himself is like the grain of wheat. Uh, and just as you would put a grain of wheat into the soil, in order for it to bear fruit, you've got to bury it in the earth. So too, Jesus is going to have to die and be buried before he can rise again and bring the fruit of everlasting life. So it's a kind of interesting analogy here because we moderns don't usually think of a seed as dying, but Jesus is drawing that analogy out in order to get you to start thinking about his own passion, death, and resurrection. And if you have any doubts about that, he follows up this analogy with a more explicit declaration where he says, whoever loves his life is going to lose it, but whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, what does that mean, hate his life? <laughs> this is, uh, it's not in the way we would mean if someone said, I hate my life, you know, uh, that would mean that you despair and you just don't have any happiness or joy in your life. That's not what Jesus means. Um, you'll recall in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, unless a man hates his father and mother, um, he cannot be my disciple. The word hatred uh, in the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, for example, can be used as a technical term for separating yourself from someone or a divorce, right? So it's a kind of detachment. Uh, it's hyperbolic. It's, it's exaggerated, right? Uh, it, Jesus isn't actually commanding us to hate our father and mother. What he's saying is, if you love your father and mother more than me, then you're not going to be worthy of me. You have to be willing to detach from your family and attach to me. You have to make me the number one priority in your life. Um, and so the same thing's true here. In other words, whoever clings to his life in this world, and who isn't willing to lay down their life, they're not going to have eternal life. 
And Jesus is going to be the supreme example of that because he's not going to cling to his earthly life. He's not going to cling to his human life. He's going to willingly lay down his life on the cross. And it's precisely by being willing to die that he's going to also be able to be raised again and that he will enter into the eternal life of uh, the kingdom of God and into life with the Father in his ascension. So he's trying to teach us about the mystery of his passion, death, and resurrection. And he's using imagery here both from the wheat, but also just from the, the language of losing your life to try to teach that message to disciples, to try to um, open up the mystery of the cross to them.